gold plates in Saudi Arabia. Wow. Right? Big deal. Right where Lehi's family was traveling, this could establish the veracity of the Book of Mormon by providing an additional confirmation that people were writing on gold plates at the time. So perhaps like many of you, I had a whole bunch of people on social media and friends texting me, sending me a link to a video that came out from the Stick of Joseph YouTube channel in which they analyze what's going on here with the claims of these gold plates uh, coming out of Saudi Arabia. So the question for us to consider today is, are these plates real? Now, I've seen a lot of hype, but we're going to put on our critical thinking hats to try to get to the bottom of this and figure out, is this legit or not? And I think the answer might surprise you a little bit. Let's start with the first minute coming from this Stick of Joseph video where they tease up what's going on here. Take a look. A chamber going down in there, and uh, they discovered, we saw the pictures, there was a lot of gold artifacts. <laughs> okay, dude. <laughs> That sounds an awful lot like the description that Joseph and Oliver Cowdery gave. I did not have on my bingo card that the plain and precious things would be revealed through Shabbat this Night guy. Live <laughs> and, a, and, and a Christian Bible Lands tour group. This is nuts. It's interesting how Yehovah allows these things to happen with modern excavation equipment to prove that his people have been everywhere all the time. They were, they were. Wow. Oh, it's a cold so, As to why some are gold, some are lead. I would guess it would be more important. That the morning precious books, the, 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 the creme de la creme stories were in the gold one. And, and maybe the clips notes of the blood books. Okay. Yep. Oh, the summary. There's a longer version of history on the brass plates, but here I'm writing the most, the more precious stuff and a summary of my, of my reign and ministry. All right. Now the video, if you watch their full video, it's like 90 minutes long. And all it really is, is a react video to another YouTube video from the original individuals who are kind of making this claim, saying that they found these gold plates and talking about uh, what they are. And so Stick of Joseph links over to this original video. And so, of course, a lot of people from their channel go over to this other one. And what you find in the comments of that original video are a whole bunch of exuberant Mormons tickled pink that we have independent second confirmation and additional evidence of writing on gold plates coming out of a geography, a, a location where it's very plausible that Lehi and his family traversed uh, on their way to the land Bountiful and then across the waters to this country. Here's a, a smattering, a little sample of many of the comments that we can find on this original YouTube video. All the Latter-day Saints in here like, and? Lehi's family from the Book of Mormon exited Jerusalem through Saudi Arabia. This is great for the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Thank you for validating proof of gold plates being used by Hebrew tribes to write sacred text. Hurrah for Israel! Hosanna to the Most High God! I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I am giddy with excitement about this. We are not crazy people for believing that the Book of Mormon was translated by Joseph Smith from gold plates. These men just don't understand what they have or its importance. Latter-day Saints, gold plates? Most precious writings, seals on the book, 2,000 years old, you don't say. Good stuff. And finally, anyone LDS remember this from President Russell M. Nelson, quote, In coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Between now and the time he returns with power and great glory, he will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. Now, there's a lot more where that came from. A lot of eager and exuberant Mormons really excited about what's going on here, what's being claimed. Now, who are these people that posted this video? What is the source? Who's talking about this? Who's claiming that they have these gold plates? Well, the context here is that this YouTube channel is called Shabbat Night Live, or that's the program uh, for this YouTube channel. The channel itself uh, is called Arud Awakening, R-O-O-D. And this is from a, an individual named Michael Rood, where uh, he's an author, a historian, a teacher, a broadcaster, and self-described lifelong student of the Bible, a most unique, uh, his bio says, biblical chronologist. It goes on to say, Michael's dig site, as an archaeologist, is the Bible, and his tools are research skills gained from decades of biblical study and the unique experience of living in Israel, surrounded by authentic yet dismissed historic sites, 
that hold archaeological proof of the Bible's most fantastic stories. So that's the guy behind the channel. He's got a whole bunch of different programming on the channel, including this show, Shabbat Night Live, in which these claims are being made. So the, the host of this video sets up the narrative, pitches the story at the outset. Let's take a quick look to set the stage and, and frame what's going on here. Hey, Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. You know, if there was ever a true-to-life Indiana Jones story told on this stage, it is tonight. This is wild. I mean, phone calls in the middle of the night, secret messages with unnamed people in the middle of Saudi Arabia, and an honest-to-goodness book made of gold. All true. Just, it, it is what it is. You can't make this stuff up. I love that, right? You can't make this stuff up. Well, you can. And as I'm later going to suggest, I, I think that's what's going on here. But it's kind of humorous at the outset. You can't make this stuff up. Well, all right. So the host is interviewing two people on this program, uh, Miles Jones and Patrick McGuire. Uh, the, the main character in this is really Miles Jones. So we're going to focus on him a little bit later. But let's unpack a little bit of what they're claiming so that we can then respond to it and put on our critical thinking hats to try and understand, is this legit? Did this actually happen? Is this uh, claim uh, legit? And, and are these plates real? Okay, so what happened here, uh, the way that they apparently got a hold of these plates is, you know, Miles Jones is over in Saudi Arabia and a lady who's involved with their expedition company where they take people over to the Middle East and they show them all these sites and claim that that's where that happened in the Bible and so forth. There's this lady involved with the company, and she approaches Miles Jones, and she says, hey, I want to meet, I want you to meet this, uh, this unnamed Arab individual and, uh, and who has the plates. So let's take a look. She said, there's someone I trust, and I trust you, and I wanted to bring you together. I made an appointment for you at 6 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So it's already <laughs> like 2 o'clock in the morning. So uh, I, I just said, Okay, I'll be there. So I go down at six o'clock in the morning, and this Arab that she had contacted that she trusted will leave him unnamed. Um, he op opened up this bag, and the first thing he pulled it out was this book with pages of beaten gold. All right, so the guy pulls out a, a book with beaten pages of gold out of a bag. Sounds intriguing, sounds promising. So then, why did Dr. Jones, Miles Jones, why did he get excited uh, about this particular set of gold plates? It was right there. You can see on the book a signet circle, and I'll give you a better look at it, a signet circle with the yod heh vav -Heh in it. That's what interests me. Wow. <laughs> that caught my attention right away. You had the in the ancient letters. You have the Yod Hey Vav Hey. Mm. This is obviously a Hebrew artifact that has been discovered in Arabia. I love that, right? Uh, obviously, a Hebrew artifact. Now, what is it about Doctor Jones that allows him to be able to pass determination like that and say conclusively that obviously it's a Hebrew artifact? What are his credentials? What's his background? We'll get into that in just a second. But how old is this artifact? Right, Doctor Jones. How? What are we looking at here? How old is this? Here's what he said. Yeah, how old is this thing? What? What do we have any estimation as to where, when this thing came from? Well, we do have some estimation. Uh, it's probably at least two thousand years old. Wow, at least. Really, it could be older than that. But the information on it is definitely the story of the. Uh, Say that. Israelites as they as they came through because it's a it is a story basically in both pictures and prose. So and we have managed to translate enough of it to tell what is going on in here. I love that. Well, it's probably two thousand years old. It could be longer. I don't actually know. I'm just kind of making things up. Uh, the the language in here is apparently Paleo Hebrew, and uh, I, I just had to laugh about this guy. Right, Miles Jones. He's a he's a doctor. He's Doctor Jones, and so here's how the host is asking him about whether he's at all like Indiana. This literally is like watching an Indiana Jones movie. The it, guys it is. lived. So it, I know it's uh, it, it's a Doctor Jones movie. Is what it is. We'll just keep it at that. I just oh, when in situations like this, faced with gold archives, I always ask myself, 
what would Indiana Jones do? Yeah. <laughs> got a pocket, got a bag of sand to replace it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you need to legally change your name to Indiana from Miles, I think. Yeah. There you or Colonel, right. at least. Yeah. <laughs> okay, time to put on our critical thinking caps. To analyze this a little bit, now you can go watch the original video if you want. There's a lot that they talk about. A lot of it's not relevant. But there's all this intrigue of secret meetings, and they're transported in a Mercedes to this other location. They didn't have bags over their heads, but, you know, they go to this other undescribed location to meet unnamed people who have all sorts of artifacts and other books and all these types of things. And and uh, and so there's just a lot to the story, but I've shared with you the essence so that we can try and understand what's actually going on here. So let's put on the critical thinking hats. And at first, at the outset, I want to establish that I think skepticism of this as an initial position is warranted. Why is that? Many reasons come to mind. Perhaps most recently, a little over a decade ago, was the the Jordan-led codices. These are uh, allegations of books that were found uh, in a cave in Jordan and published uh, publicized in March 2011. Uh, they were apparently or allegedly found in the possession of a farmer who claimed that they had been found by his great-grandfather in a cave a century ago. Take a look at how the media reacted to these claims. Here for said... This could be the major discovery of Christian history. It could be the earliest crystallizing of existence. The most important archaeological find, approximately 70 small volumes, could then fold the writing of the New Testament. They may contain contemporary accounts of the final years of Jesus. And at the heart of the media storm was this man, David Elkington, Gloucestershire's very own Indiana Jones, an adventuring scholar who with his wife brought the so-called Jordan Codices from the Middle East to the West Country. But the, the find is just too important to really to disappear into private hands. Because of what it, it's not about money with them for you, it's about what these artifacts can tell us about early Christians. Exactly. So these codices, these little books, these lead books, uh, make their way into the hands of a gentleman named David Elkington, who becomes the main kind of advocate for their veracity. And uh, he says, you know, the plates were given to him and stated that the, the find, the archaeological find, consisted of up to 70 ring-bound books or codices made of lead and copper. Many of them are sealed on all sides, he said. Scrolls, tablets, other artifacts, including an incense bowl, were found at the same site. Some of the lead pages are written in a form of archaic Hebrew script with ancient messianic symbols. Well, Elkington is not an academic. He doesn't have recognized qualifications in the field. Not that I'm a fan of, you know, having expert credentials and I have an acronym after my name. Therefore, I'm right. And yet we can try and initially uh, determine whether we should be skeptical based on if a particular individual has any relevant credibility, whether academic or experiential, that would allow him to kind of make these conclusions and say, this is what I'm claiming it is. Well, there's a government agency in Israel called the Israel Antiques Authority, and their sole purpose is to protect and preserve Israel's archaeological heritage. And so they basically review all these claims of different artifacts and things, and uh, they consider the, uh, the Jordan-led codices uh, to be inauthentic, to be worthless, a mixture of incompatible periods and styles without any connection or logic. Such forged motifs can be found, they say, in their thousands in the antique markets of Jordan and elsewhere in the Middle East. So this was a big deal and all these claims. Well, then you got Israel, you got many other people and, and you know, scholars more broadly who widely consider that these uh, codices, these books are, are fakes, they're forgeries. So, you know, everyone's all abuzz. Oh my gosh. And then all of a sudden, okay, you know, it's a forgery, right? Uh, in our church, that happened uh, in the 80s with Mark Hoffman and the Salamander Letter. It was a, a, a counterfeit forged letter from Martin Harris to W.W. W. Phelps talking about, among other things, the first vision, saying that or when, when Joseph got the, the plates, when he dug them up, allegedly that a salamander appeared, which transformed itself into a spirit that refused to give Joseph the plates unless his brother Alvin uh, was also present, which wasn't possible because Alvin had already died by this point. And so what happened potentially here was Mark Hoffman, who's the forger, uh, may have been trying to associate Joseph's obtaining of the plates with a rumor that was going around back then that Alvin's grave had been dug up by the Smith's family uh, to use his remains in some magical ceremony. So 
Mark Hoffman completely forges these things. Experts review them. Everyone's like, yeah, this looks accurate. You know, there's no signs of any forgery or whatever. Someone buys the letter, donates it to the church. Experts review it. They're like, yeah, it was, you know, looks legit. The church publishes it in the church news, April 28th, 1985. And, uh, and they revealed the contents. They said, here's what this is. And alongside that was a quote from President Hinckley. Uh, and uh, in the first presidency, he said that no one, of course, can be certain that Martin Harris wrote the document. However, at this point, we accept the judgment of the examiner that there is no indication that it is a forgery. This does not preclude the possibility that it may have been forged at a time when the church had many enemies. It is, however, an interesting document of the times. Okay, so here's President Hinckley, right, in the First Presidency saying, we have no evidence that it's a forgery. It may have been forged way back then, perhaps. We don't know what's going on, but here's this letter and and many people believe that this was an actual letter from Martin Harris to W. W. Feltz. It was a total fraud. Mark Hoffman, you know, you've probably seen the Netflix uh, show uh, Murder in, Among the Mormons or whatever it's called, right? He uh, killed some people in the 80s, a uh, massive counterfeiting scheme, trying to create these early Mormon documents and pass them off as legit to uh, to earn money. So skepticism is warranted. That That's the point that I want to establish as we now talk about these gold plates from Saudi Arabia. There's examples before, including with metal plates uh, and, and ancient uh, Hebraic writing, or at least the allegation of that, the claim, uh, to suggest that, okay, skepticism here, right, is a little bit warranted. Then the next thing for our, our critical thinking process is to discuss the provenance. Uh, the provenance, what, is it, what does that mean? Well, it means the history of ownership of a particular object, especially, you know, the documentation or the authentication uh, it's the chain of custody. Can we verify the origin story of whatever is being claimed here? And so there's some questions that we should ask when we see a claim being made like this. I know we got a bunch of trigger-happy YouTube commenters over on those videos saying, oh my gosh, this is exciting, right? And they're not pausing to think critically about this. But if they were to do so, these are some of the questions they should ask. Uh, have the plates been authenticated by anyone independent of those making the claim? Have the parties involved been identified? Right. Dr. Jones is talking about unnamed Arabs and, you know, unnamed groups of people and won't name any of the people involved. So have they been identified? Uh, has the discovery site been identified? Have other people gone to independently look at this and try and identify if the plates did come from there? If there's any trace, you know, whatever, or are there other things there? So has the location been identified? Have the plates been dated to determine how old they actually are? Contrary to Dr. Jones, just come out with a number. Uh, have the inscriptions been translated and authenticated by professional linguists who are experts in that particular language? Uh, and then, of course, what's the provenance of this item? What's the history of ownership? Who, how did it change hands and by whom? Uh, and, and only then should we consider this as potential evidence of, of something verifiably real. We have to answer questions like this. And the, the video, the original video, is scant on details. Now, I want to leave open the very minute possibility that these questions can be positively answered and uh, and that there is an opportunity or a scenario in which these are legit. But as we'll get into here, as we go through this, I don't really think that's the case. Because the next question we should ask is, who's this Dr. Jones guy? This Miles Jones who's making this claim. This is the guy who's shown up on a, a rude awakening on YouTube. He's not going to the media. He's not going to the scholars. He's not going to the academics. He's not going to anybody else other than this YouTube channel to make this claim and to say that they found these plates. So who is this guy? All right, well, I'm going to walk us through his biography, and then we're going to unpack this a little bit, because inside this biography lies a number of clues about what's going on here. Dr. Miles Jones has earned three degrees in languages and linguistics, culminating in a doctorate from the University of Texas at Austin in 1985. He's the author of The Writing of God, in which he translated ancient Hebrew inscriptions from Mount Sinai in Midian, Arabia. These inscriptions provided physical proof of the location of the real Mount Sinai. He has uncovered the earliest manuscript of the Gospels in Hebrew and authenticated their first century origin. Most recently, in March of 2023, Dr. Jones returned from an expedition to Mount Sinai in Arabia to document the evidence of the exodus found there. On that expedition, 
he uncovered the archives of the Banu Qurayza, a priestly Hebrew tribe in Arabia, including a book of their history made out of pages of beaten gold. Okay, a lot to unpack. Let's start with just the very first sentence. He earned three degrees in languages and linguistics, culminating in a doctorate from the University of Texas at Austin. Well, what were these degrees? I looked and looked and looked, and this was hard information to find. It wasn't necessarily hard. It just took a while because all his biographies and his books and his events and his speaking and his website just say he's earned three degrees in languages and logistics, uh, linguistics, culminating in a doctorate, right? And that's how it says it. Well, he got a bachelor's in language and linguistics from Antioch University. Then he got a master's degree in bilingual education, also from Antioch University. And then that doctorate that it kind of dangles out there at the end from the University of Texas at Austin, the doctorate was in foreign language education, right? This guy is not deeply learning kind of Hebrew linguistic whatever and Semitic you know, languages, and and he's not this, like, deep academic. He got a bachelor's in language and linguistics, and then he goes into the education realm of this, as we'll see in just a moment. His real bio, uh, he he has this company called Jones Geniuses Accelerated Learning Math Curricula, and the bio on that website paints a totally different picture about this guy, one that is far less, shall we say, embellished or exaggerated when it comes to this biblical Hebraic type of stuff. Here's the, a portion of the bio on his other website that talks about, uh, in more concrete detail, I think, some of his background. So Dr. Miles Jones uh, created this curricula as a result of decades of research and practice in education. In 2004, he established a nonprofit called the Institute for Accelerated Learning to help get his curricula into the hands of more children who need it. He's now the director of training and curricula at the Institute In the 80s, Dr. Jones was associate director of the Lozanoff Learning Institute in Dallas, where he became a respected international specialist in accelerated learning. Then it goes on to talk more about accelerated learning and education and his whole professional focus here. Going throughout the 80s and 90s, he's a specialist. He's a professor of English. He returns home to Texas, where he teaches in public school for six years as a classroom teacher. Uh, He's an instruction specialist and assistant professor professor of education at Texas A&M. So this guy's whole career is in just language type of education more broadly and not this like very deep, narrow, scholarly academic stuff that might potentially qualify him for having a background here. Okay, so then he's got his his Writing of God book in which he translated ancient Hebrew inscriptions allegedly from Mount Sinai. Well, he's just claiming that it's Mount Sinai. He and some of his associates believe that there's this particular mountain that is Mount Sinai. But it's just their opinion. This is kind of like the Mormons and the, the narrow neck of land. Oh, that precise narrow neck of land must have been where this Book of Mormon event happened and making these like conclusions and, and determinations based on one's interpretation and guess about a match between a current geogra- uh, geological, you know, whatever, and something from the scripture. So that's what this guy is doing with Mount Sinai. And yet he's conclusively saying, this is Mount Sinai, uh, in which he found some some uh, some Hebrew inscriptions, which he translated. None of this has been peer-reviewed, mind you. This book that he writes hasn't been you know peer-reviewed at all. It's just what he's claiming that hasn't been substantiated by, by others. And then it further says that uh, he authenticated, so he uncovers the earliest manuscript of the... So here's a guy who, who is translating ancient inscriptions. He finds and, and or knows about the real Mount Sinai, he uncovers the earliest manuscript of the Gospels in Hebrew. He authenticates their first century origin. I don't know how he has the qualifications to legitimately authenticate them. And then he finds uh, or is introduced to the unnamed Arab who provides him with the gold plates. Like, just even statistically, what are the chances that any person, even a highly qualified person, uh, could be in a scenario in which they, they find the actual Mount Sinai, they translate Hebrew inscriptions. Um, they they uncover this person, same person, uncovers the earliest manuscript uh, of the Gospels in Hebrew. You have the ability to then authenticate them yourself, and you find these gold plates that talk about Israelites in Saudi Arabia 2,000 years ago. Like, even just statistically, it's kind of ludicrous at this point to think that any one person uh, can, you know, strike gold, as it were, uh, that many times. Okay, so... 
I want to mention that we should be careful in scrutinizing the messenger. After all, Joseph Smith was a farm boy, right? This unlearned kid. He had no academic background. He had no scholarly qualifications of any kind. So it's not that these things are absolutely necessary. Now, in my mind, part of the difference is when you're called of God, God's going to call the humble people, right, who are more willing to listen uh, and to contrast them and their ability to heed counsel and, and receive divine instruction in contrast to the, the learned, right, or who say, oh, that's not the way we do it, and that's not the accepted practice. So I want to leave open that possibility that this guy doesn't need to have any particular background, because if Joseph did it, anybody can do it. Yet, Dr. Jones is not claiming any divine intervention of any kind, no guidance, no nothing, just a lot of good luck, apparently, to be at the right place at the right time and find all these amazing things. Okay, so now we got to talk about past exploits as the next step in our critical thinking process. What's been going on in the past that might inform what's happening in the present? Well, in 2007, a gentleman named Bob Cornuke uh, announced the discovery of this stone object that had an inscription he claimed that said Yahweh, the name of the, the God in Israelites. He claimed that this was on the stone. And according to Cornuke, this inscribed stone was found in Saudi Arabia at a site called Jebel al-Laz, and that's the site that he believes, and Dr. Jones as well believes, is Mount Sinai. And then this stone was given to the governor of Mecca. Well, there's another claim out there, apparently, that the stone was actually found in Tabuk, uh, which is 80 miles to the southeast. And so this discrepancy regarding the provenance of this stone that allegedly says Yahweh on it, this provenance is disputed, hasn't been resolved. So then you get uh, this scholar from Oxford, he's uh, this scholar in Semitic inscriptions, uh, Dr. Michael McDonald, who, in reference to this stone, declared, I'm almost certain that the sculpture is fake. And then he has this whole long quote I'm not going to get into, but he basically explains that he thinks it's a forgery. And then finally, as we connect the dots over to Dr. Jones, there's a group called the Associates for Bible Research. So these are some biblical archaeologists and researchers and, uh, and after they posted an article on their website disputing the legitimacy of this stone that says Yahweh on it, uh, Dr. Jones came forward to take credit and said, I'm the person that translated the name Yahweh on the tablet. And, uh, you know, he has no background, of course, that we can find at all in Hebrew or other Semitic languages, especially Talmudic or South Semitic, the language on the inscribed stone. But he apparently translated Yahweh and told everyone that's what it is. So Jones goes to this group, the Associates for Bible Research, that had published this article criticizing the stone and his translation. He goes to the organization and says, hey, I want to publish a rebuttal. So the director of research for this organization says, yeah, we'd be totally fine with that. But what you need is to have a, a scholarly publication of this inscription that includes the provenance proof of authenticity, translation, and proof of date. And Jones, apparently, according to the people uh, with this organization, Jones allegedly said he would do this. And uh, when they published their article or updated it three years later, he still hadn't done it. Uh, done it. There's, there was no scholarly peer-reviewed article of any kind. Um, and, and that was over a decade ago. So now it's been a decade and a half since Jones apparently requested the opportunity to do a rebuttal. He was told that he'd have to have some scholarly rigor to it. He'd have to have independent verification, peer review. And then that was enough for him to back off and just, uh, you know, continue to go off and claim to his group of people and his followers that this stone is what he claimed it was, but shying away from that peer review and that verification. So the point here is that this guy, from what I can tell just on cursory research, doesn't necessarily have a good track record. So that just adds another little point, right, to... Uh, maybe I should be skeptical. Maybe I should disbelieve. And then, frankly, just the BS meter of this whole thing, the the secret meetings, like folks who announce a discovery like this on a YouTube channel that few people have really heard of in the broader context of things, I think that initially is a sign of, okay, this probably isn't legit because, again, if someone had a discovery of this nature, they would probably uh, be going to a totally different establishment or outlet to be able to share this with the world. Okay, a final point as we wrap this up. So the, the summary here is that I think if we do some critical thinking about this, it's highly likely uh, that this is not what they are claiming. We have no clue what the provenance is. We don't know who the secret people are. 
this Jones guy doesn't have relevant credentials. He's got some other stuff in his record that seems kind of questionable. It's basically statistically impossible that any one person be at the right time in the right place to find and discover and authenticate and translate all these different things, especially someone who doesn't really have the background for it and apparently has no, you know, deep understanding of these issues. But he's just the guy who's, you know, in the crux of this whole thing and lightning keeps striking, uh, you know, catching lightning in a bottle or whatever that saying is again and again and again, right? Like the, the odds are just stacked up against this. So I, I think we can conclude from this, at least I conclude from this, that it is highly, highly, highly likely that this is some kind of fraud or fake. Now, who knows who the unnamed Arab is, and he finds this gullible Dr. Jones who wants to believe these things because he's going around telling everyone, that's Mount Sinai, and I transcribed these things and translated them, right? And so, of course, that becomes a, a good target uh, to go and sell your, your, uh, your, your wares, your, uh, your fraud, fraudulent materials, much like Mark Hoffman, sold materials to the church, to other private buyers, right? Because these people were willing buyers for that type of material. Now, you know, if the church wanted to, I mean, the church still has its in its possession Joseph Searstone. <laughs> so if they really wanted to verify if these were legitimate gold plates from ancient Israelites, uh, you know, why not use the power of being a seer to try and actually understand if this is from God or not? Now, if we go back to that salamander letter that I was just talking about with Mark Hoffman, at the time, uh, then Elder Oaks, now President Oaks, gave a speech at BYU in 1987 uh, in which he said the following, In order to perform their personal ministries, church leaders cannot be suspicious and questioning of each of the hundreds of people they meet each year. Ministers of the gospel function best in an atmosphere of trust and love. In that kind of atmosphere, they fail to detect a few deceivers, but that is the price they pay to increase their effectiveness in counseling, comforting, and blessing the hundreds of honest and sincere people they see. It is better for a church leader to be occasionally disappointed than to be constantly suspicious. Of course, this is in reference to the fact that, you know, Hinckley and others at the up in church leadership were going along with Mark Hoffman, were leaving the experts who were all saying there were no signs of forge forgery, uh, and more importantly, that these church leaders did not themselves discover the fraud, that they did not apparently have the prophetic you know, inspiration to be able to see through this and, and identify it for what it is. So this is kind of Oaks's argument to say, well, they're well-meaning people who want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, so it's better to do that and occasionally get burned than it is to be skeptical of people. Well, I don't think you need to be skeptical of everyone in your ministry and be skeptical of everyone's story or testimony or whatever, right? I think that's different than someone with this this fancy claim uh, of a particular document or a particular record that uh, that has a, a a historical substance to it. That's different than just talking to this person you're ministering to. So perhaps for church leaders and for all of us, skepticism is warranted, especially when significant claims like this are being. Uh, made another point is that you know our leaders can be gullible as well. They're as as Oaks here himself concedes, right? That is kind of the human condition, and so I think that is all the more reason why we need a spirit of discernment, especially with all of the deceptions swirling around our society today. I'm reminded in particular of Doctrine and Covenants section 46, verse 8: Wherefore beware lest ye are deceived. And that you may not be deceived, seek ye earnestly the best gifts, always remembering for what they are given. Now, I think one of those gifts is the gift of discernment. And I think you and I can cultivate that gift and we can seek that gift. And I think that is so needed today that in this world, swirling in deceptions, we need to make sure that we understand truth. Because we are being bombarded, I believe, with fraud, uh, fraudulent claims, with deceptions, with misinformation, uh, subjective morality, all this nonsense going around in our society. And so cultivating that gift and that spirit of discernment, I think, is critical. We can't rely on our leaders to tell us, is this real or not? Is this legit or not? Right? Because as Oaks himself concedes, they're just assuming the best of everything. They're relying on the experts. If the experts as fallible, normal individuals can be duped, then if church leaders are just relying on the counsel and suggestion of uh, of these experts and not applying their own discernment or not having that revelatory whatever, right? They fall into the same traps that a lot of us can fall into. So it's kind of on us. It's incumbent on us 
to seek for that discernment, to apply that discernment, and not be some of these YouTube commenters like I shared earlier where you're just jumping on the bandwagon, getting all excited, and you know the thrill going up your leg. Oh, wow, can you imagine? Right? Let's use some critical thinking. Now, when we're talking about spiritual matters, that doesn't mean we should critically and skeptically evaluate everything. There's a faith component to all of this as well. But we got to use our brains. We can't just rely on someone's claim and go along with it and be swept up in it because chances are, right, like the Jordan-led codices and the Salamander letter with Mark Hoffman and so many other examples, we can get burned. We can be deceived. Wherefore, beware lest ye are deceived and that you may not be deceived. You seek ye earnestly the best gifts, always remembering for what they are given. God doesn't want us to be deceived. He's told us to beware so that we don't be deceived. And yet we find so many people around us getting swept up in these claims, being deceived, only to later discover that they were duped and that they were led to believe something was true that in fact was not. So again, tiny little uh, window of, of potential that these gold plates could be legit, but I think the odds are like 0.001% or something. I, I just don't think the narrative here fits. I don't think the people involved fit. I don't think the providence is good. Um, and who knows, maybe unlike with that stone, Dr. Jones and others are going to arrange to get these plates inspected by a broader group of people and have their translations and things peer-reviewed and open it up to scrutiny from other people who can kind of evaluate the claims and determine if this is real or not. Now, based on what I can find online from past behavior, I'm going to guess that that's not going to happen because he probably knows what would happen. Therefore, he's just going to keep it to himself away from peer review and claim to all the gullible followers he can get that it is what it is without having that substantiated outside independent review. So uh, buyer beware, viewer beware. Let's not get swept along in all these claims. Let's be initially skeptical, especially with stuff like this where we've been burned and or other people have been burned on issues like this in the past. Let's have a default position of saying these very likely aren't legit, still leaving open the opportunity that they could be if they go through the proper steps to have other eyeballs and independent reviewers and get outside perspective rather than basing this solely on the claims of people who apparently have a very poor track record.